Hello, I'm Marielle Jessup, president of the American Heart Association. I'm here in Dallas at the end of our scientific sessions 2013. And the man behind the program, Dr. Robert Harrington, who was the chair of our committee of scientific session program. Bob, first of all, let me tell you what a great meeting it was. Thank you, Mary Allett. You know, it would probably the time to note that this meeting takes a lot of people. It took a large, almost 70 person Committee on Scientific Sessions programming, and AHA staff certainly supply so much experience and wisdom and skill in putting this meeting together. And it was a great, was a great week. Well, why don't you tell me what you think the highlights of the meeting were? Well, as you know well, one of the terrific things about AHA scientific sessions is that we span the spectrum of cardiovascular health and science from the most basic of discovery science up through population health. But maybe the thing that sticks out most and that most people want to know about are the late-breaking clinical trials. And this year was no exception. Well, maybe it was an exception. We had a record number, as you know, 100 late-breaking clinical trial submissions from which we selected 20. And they were just an extraordinary listing of things ranging from resuscitation science through preschool intervention on heart health for children in South America, to heart failure, to atrial fibrillation management. And if I think of just a few things that were really notable, the two resuscitation trials on Sunday, which dealt with targeted temperature management or controlled hypothermia, both testing important clinical questions. Number one, should you cool patients who survive a cardiac arrest out of the hospital? That has important policy implications right. for how you outfit emergency medicine services, and the answer is no. There seems to be no advantage to that. Right, might be applied very quickly from people that were here. The, immediately, because yes. now we know that we don't need to outfit our EMS providers with that specific expertise, that specific technology. You move quickly into the week, and we saw a very important trial performed by Chris Cooper and the Coral Investigators, funded by NHLBI, with renal stenting, and asking the really pertinent question, in your patient with multidrug resistant hypertension and or chronic kidney disease who have atherosclerotic renal artery disease, does it make a difference? Does it improve their outcome if you stent that lesion? And the answer is no, it does not improve outcome. And it's amazing because we've been asking that question for a long time. Chris Cooper noted during the news conference that he's been involved with trying to answer this question for over a dozen years. Wow. And, you know, the perseverance of the group of investigators. And we should talk a bit about the support of NHLBI. Absolutely. Now, how many uh, trials were actually uh, funded by the NHLBI of the late breakers? There were at least four. We know that the CT surgery network, the trial of ischemic MR treatment, mitral valve repair versus mitral valve replacement. We know that the heart failure network, ROSE, acute the Rose heart trial. failure, right. top cat, and then a very interesting trial done by Steve Kimmel investigators at, uni at your university, University right. of Pennsylvania, um, COAG, which tested the notion that if you're using excellent algorithms based on clinical characteristics, does the knowledge of the genotype of that patient improve warfarin dosing? And the answer is no. Boy, it's a little discouraging. Uh, I, I did hear some people say, wish they were more positive trials. I mean, you're used to thinking about trials. Is, are negative trials bad? I thought Mark Pfeffer, the top cat investigator, said it best in the late-breaking clinical trial session when he said, I don't like the term negative trials. Trials are to inform, and this week we got a lot of information. We've informed the community. Yes, and sometimes things not to do, but that's important information because some of the things that we've learned not to do, many of us were doing them, and now we need to rethink our practice. Well, that's ha exactly right. And of course, I'm used to heart failure trials just informing and not having positive results. Well, how did you interpret TopCat, which was one of the big news stories of the week? Right, this was using aldosterone antagonists in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. And uh, although the endpoint looking at mortality or survival 
um, was a neutral uh, endpoint, there was a signal that perhaps it was reducing hospitalizations. I suspect we're going to debate about this quite a lot. The other trial that was presented at that session, the ROSE trial, as you said, funded by the Heart Failure Network, I think actually um, will turn out to be an important investigation as well. It looked at two drugs that we give in addition to IV diuretics in a patient with acute decompensated heart failure. Some people like to use nasiratide because they believed that it enhances diuresis. Some people like to give dopamine. There is a subset of patients, particularly those patients with low blood pressure, that seem to do possibly a little bit better with dopamine. Overall, the trial was, like so many heart failure trials, uh, not showing a, a superior benefit of either one, but I think it will inform what we do as clinicians. Yeah, let's take go back to the spironolactone observation in TopCat. I, I'd love to know your opinion on this subset, pre-specified, looking at the positive BNP patients looked like there was a treatment effect, and that might be a special group of patients that we should pay attention to. Well, of course, we don't know why people benefit with HEFREF or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction from aldosterone antagonists. So maybe really sick patients with HEFPEF have the same important pathophysiology. So unfortunately, we sort of always have to work backwards. We know what drugs, um, we know drugs work, now we have to fi figure out why they work. Yeah, that's a very good point. One of the one of the beauties of the heart failure network is that they're willing to tackle some of these more what I'll call mechanistic questions. Right, right. Well, certainly one of the big pieces of news for the week, and even in the week leading up to the meeting, was the release of the prevention guidelines. Four documents in total, by, started by the NHLBI with their extensive literature evaluation, evidence evaluation, and then carried forth over the last several months by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. You led the session this morning, which was a fabulous one, where the authors had a chance to really lay out to the community what they were thinking of as they went through the process. What did you learn? Well, I think um, you're absolutely right. We had a terrific session this morning about the four documents, how to manage cholesterol, how to assess risk, as you decide about the treatment of cholesterol, the management of overweight and obesity, and lifestyle. And these are a, a suite of uh, documents for the prevention of cardiovascular disease and stroke. Let's be honest, there was lots of discussion about these guidelines, which were released right before our meeting, and uh, some controversy about them. Today, as a, as a part of planned scientific discourse, all four lead authors got a chance to really discuss what the evidence was, the questions that they used to compile the evidence, and the recommendations. And what I learned is a lot of the hyperbole over the few days from some, uh, some researchers that weren't part of the guidelines probably didn't merit so much attention. And today's session really explained how the risk profile assessment tool or risk assessment tool should be used by clinicians. And everybody seems to agree it's an advance in, over what we've done in the past with the Framingham score. Well, it, it certainly um, was a set of guidelines built on rigorous evaluation of the available evidence. And maybe one of the more important things you learned from this morning is read the guidelines before you listen to the news reports. Right. Because the news reports, for better or worse, have to really hone in on some top line items. That's important, no question about it. But for the clinician, the patient, we really need to get into the details. And for me, what I learned is risk assessment begins the discussion with our patients, as Dr. Stone said, shouldn't end it. And I thought right. that was the most, one of the more sort of poignant and pointed observations I heard coming out of this morning. And I think all of the guidelines really um, were well summarized by saying it's still important to know your numbers, but you have to treat your risk. Yeah, that's a good way to think about yeah. it. And they kept going back and forth to that. Yes, we want, you should have your numbers and you should have a variety of 
pieces of information, whether it's your CT angio or your family history, you bring all of that to the table and then only you and your provider can really talk about right. where that puts you on a risk scale and what you should do about it. One final thing that I, I think is just a terrific highlight is the hypertension algorithm that was published also um, from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, Cardiology and the CDC. This is a simple, no frills algorithm designed to help basic uh, frontline clinicians to manage high blood pressure using low cost generic drugs. We talked about that this morning too, and I think there's a lot of excitement to use that kind of standard care as an approach to um, the uh, management of patients with heart failure. Well, and certainly as the document came out, built upon the important work by Alan Goh and others in the Kaiser system, right. showing that when you actually do this in a big population, you can make a difference and you can increase the number of patients who have blood pressure under the goal. Up to 87%. Yeah, it was that, really an extraordinary piece was, of work. Um, right. Well, it's, again, I want to wish you and your entire committee and your co-chair, Ken Block, for uh, just a terrific meeting and uh, congratulations. Thanks, Marielle. Thanks for your support during your presidency year. And we hope that we'll see everyone next year in Chicago for Sessions 2014. Absolutely. Uh, we're closing here in Dallas for Science News. Yeah.